we're producing for the cow man. And when I say the cow man, that's a term I use with great respect. Um, anybody can be a cowboy, but it takes, it takes somebody with vision, it takes somebody with know-how to be a cow man. Five miles east of McAllen, in southeastern Hidalgo County, lies Mercedes, Texas, also known as the Queen City of the Valley. The site was first settled by ranchers in the late 1700s, a lifestyle and industry still pursued today through farming, ranching, and boot manufacturing. Rios Boots of Mercedes is the leading mass producer of many of the boots that we wear today. Mercedes is also home to one of the RGV's all-time favorite spring break events, the Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show, a culmination of rodeo competitions, livestock exhibits, carnival allure, and South Texas cooking. But tucked away in the farmlands of the Queen City flourishes a hidden gem known as England Farms. Despite its camouflaged entry off the cracked road, England Cattle Company and England Farms maintain a fundamental and complex agricultural operation. So join me on our adventure today. So the first step on our journey is all about cattle. So Mike, tell us a little bit about your cattle operation and a little history. How did you get started? Well, we started uh, back in the cattle industry, probably back in the 90s, and um, started out with, as commercial breeders. And of course, I should have named this place the Double Nickel. Uh, that comes from a nickel I had in my pocket. My wife had a nickel in her pocket, and we rubbed them together and started this whole deal. We started out in the commercial, like I said, and I'll never forget the first 40 cows that we owned, the average cost in that herd was $288 a head. And in, compared to today, uh, you couldn't even buy a, a, hardly a leg for $288. The cattle themselves- Can't buy much for $288 these days. No, the cattle themselves were just, um, they were about this fat. They were not beyond repair, but they were what I could afford. And from there, we just kind of kind of started uh, upgrading our cattle and it took a long time to do it. But uh, to now we're really in the commercial as well as the registered business. Well, we're excited to learn more. And we know that England Cattle Company doesn't just run solely with you, that it's a, it is a family operation. And that's something that along this series we'll learn is that farming and ranching is not just about one person, but it takes a whole family unit. So I'm excited to go meet your family and hear a little bit about what they do. So take me to your family, Mike. Let's go. Let's go. So you run the accounting for the cattle company, but also for the farming. But I don't think accounting is all you do. So tell us a little bit about what your day-to-day -day looks like, because I do know that you are a jack of all trades. Well, I make a plan, but it never goes that way. I mean, occasionally it will, but you know, it just depends, like, because we have the cattle people coming in, and you don't always expect them. Our people coming in to get paid, you don't expect them. So it's always a different day, different things going on. and. From year to year, it's like a lot of the cow going on and a lot of the farm coming on, so you just never know what's going to happen every day. We know that, you know, obviously you and Mike are the pillars to this business, but you also have children who help you run because this is a family unit. So introduce us to him. We'd love to meet him. Okay. This is Benton. He's in, this is his lifelong dream to be, just like his dad, to farm and ranch, so he's living the dream. 
So I mainly manage the cattle side and do the custom harvesting as well. So um, day to day, just cattle herd management and um, making sure we're producing a good product and quality. Uh, when it comes to the custom harvesting, you know, we just kind of work hand in hand, me and my dad, depending on what's going on that day, we just kind of... Mano y mano. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we mainly just uh, just try to work the best we can and do. It's, you know, it's, it's a, a day, a typical day is never the same. It's always something different. So you may have a sick cat a day or you may have, you know, your day planned out and it'll all work out, but it's not a, a typical uh, run of the mill job. It's a constant, but I love it. I can't complain. It's almost like a doctor. You have to be available 24 seven. That's right. And yeah. your cattle are your patients. Every time that you think you're gonna be done, uh, it's never works out. Yeah. <laughs> From going to functions or anything else, you gotta, you know, be careful and make sure uh, all your cattle are you know, well and doing good and calving right and everything's okay. Well, awesome. Well, tell us uh, now you, you know, you help the cattle maintain their health, herd management. You also do the custom, custom harvesting. Your mom runs the accounting and also jack of all trades, the El Jefe, the manager. Mm -hmm. But there's one important piece that uh, helps, has to help you be successful and that's marketing. One of the most important things that people don't realize is you have to be able to market your product. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to find the love of my life and she is actually uh, a social media guru and a marketer um, and she's come on now and she's doing all of our social media all of our marketing and it gets us so much further not just here in the United States but worldwide we can market cattle pretty much everywhere maybe I should hire her to work for me <laughs> <laughs> good luck I'm kind of my role here is full-fledged marketing, um, full circle, so I do everything from our digital ads to social media to um, engaging with potential clients, the videoing, photographing, um, you name it, <laughs> we, we got it. Internet is more than just uploads and downloads, it's about connecting people. VTX1 Companies is here for you, bringing communities closer together. VTX1 has connected customers for almost 70 years. Our internet service spans across South Texas to some of the most remote areas. Faster wireless service is now available in Progreso, Lozano, Rangerville, and Rancho Viejo. Call 1-800-446-2031 or visit vtx1.net to find out more. The weekend is calling. This season, answer that call by taking aim at owning your very own hunting ranch. There's nothing better than spending the cool autumn days surrounded by the great outdoors. Find a little spot in rural Texas and let us finance your place in the country. This herd of cattle represents where we start our registered program. They're all horned cattle, except for the bull, and he's polled. And polled means genetically without horns. And that's what we're trying to do here is produce polled Brahmins. We select just the best polled females out of it or polled bulls out of it. And then they go on to the next process, which would be put in a polled on polled, and then we'll ultimately end up with a poll. We do sell a number of animals that go to the show ring, but I like to think of ourselves as seed stock producers for other registered ranches. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on, girls. Come on, girls. Come here, girls. Oh, yeah. Come here. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about the process of a baby, a baby calf, all the way into a mama. Well, right now, as you can see, we still have our bulls out, and so this is our this is our breeding where we'll have uh, spring calves mainly, fall calves, 
But, um, you know, we'll, there's a few babies left out here that were born during the off season, kind of late calves. But from here they'll go once they're weaned, which is usually about six months of age, we'll take them to the pens and then they'll be processed, meaning they'll get all their vaccinations, uh, just like a, a human would. And um, then they'll get a brand and that brand will be a private herd number that'll stay with them for life. So if you can see brands on any of these cattle, that's how we identify them. And they seem so docile and so accustomed to, you know, the human and the human touch. And most cattle isn't. Why is it that this breed is? You know, we select for docility. Um, I don't want the customer to have to have to go through what we did maybe when I was young and, and uh, uh, we select r really hard for that. So you've told us a little bit about the pulled side, but talk to us a little bit about the commercial side because for those that don't know, there's not just one side to raising cattle, there's several. So explain that to us. Well, I told you that we started out with horned cows, mm -hmm. breeding pulled bulls. Then we go to the next generation and select the best pulled out of that. But for the commercial man, which we are also are commercial breeders, think about this. If we're producing pulled commercial cattle, they don't have to go through that dehorning process. So our steers, when they go to market, mm -hmm. the buyer doesn't have to worry about dehorning them. And most feedlots don't want horned animals. So they have to dehorn them somewhat just for their own animal safety and bruising of the beef and things like that. So that's just one process that the buyer doesn't have to worry about. So are these cattle actually taken and, you know, made into hamburgers, I guess Not is a these. nice way to say it? These are the breeders. Okay. All right, this is where our production all starts. All of our commercial side of it would be uh, a Brahmin maybe bred to an Angus or a Hereford or a Simmental okay. or something like that. And then some of our commercial females we keep are also a three-way cross, so they might be uh, Brahmin Hereford, and then we bred them back to an Angus. So now the the, the third cross would be they're, they're you know we, they're a three-way cross animal, commercial animal. It's a very integral part of our operation, kind of what like what I like to call our cash flow side, because who doesn't any, like cash? <laughs> any any given day, let's just say you had a bill come up, and you short on money. There's a sale yard someplace within an hour's drive of home, no matter where you live. And you could take that, that animal to the sale yard, exactly. animal sales, you collect your check that day and, and go on. But it's a huge part of the overall US as, as well as worldwide uh, food supply. It's it just the, this, where we are today is the beginning of that food chain supply. And so how difficult is it? I'm sure just like farmers, which we'll get to, we'll travel to in a second, but uh, have certain standards and regulations. How tight are those regulations on keeping your cattle health, you know, health great, not having any infections or diseases? How does that work? Is it similar to the farming or how do we work with that? Well, you can tell just looking at the pictures here, the cattle standing around here, they're not wanting for anything. Um, really because they help feed all, a lot of families on our, on our place here. Uh, they get the best of care. But it starts out even as those younger calves that you saw out here, and I talked about processing those when we wean them at six months. But they're on a vaccination program to help protect them from other diseases that may be exposed to from other countries, being our proximity to Mexico, right. or uh, maybe a customer buys them and takes them to uh, an area where where um, there might be some other diseases. So it starts there with herd health. And then after that process, really, really it's just simple animal husbandry. That one's growling at me. Yeah, she's just looking at you. She, I'm curious. running for the hills. <laughs> they're all curious. <laughs> so, you know, the beef side of it, we, we typically market all of our steers for beef in the food supply. A lot of our a lot of our heifers that we raise in the commercial side, we retain those to produce more beef type animals. And I mentioned the, the uh, embryo transfer right. and the embryo side of it. 
we'll use a lot of those as the surrogate mothers for those embryos. So we're taking the embryo out of a Brahmin cow and we put it into a surrogate mother, meaning the commercial cow, and she'll carry a Brahmin calf to term. It's much more complex than people think. And that's something that I think people need to be aware of. It's not we just go to HEB and, you know, grab our, our meat, our beef that we need. And um, not only for beef, but for different aspects of agriculture that cattle is used for. So I really appreciate you sharing your information with us. And there's so much more to learn about cattle that we just don't have time for now because we have to get to the farm because today, El Jefe, Mr. England here, he is picking cotton. So we're about to jump on the cotton picker. It's hard to let something that's been in your family for generations go, so it feels good to make a go of this. I'm Tyler Black, I'm a fourth generation farmer here in Bailey County, Texas. And we grow corn, milo, wheat, raise cattle. Working with Capital Farm Credit has been great. I mean, you're not on your own when you go into Capital Farm Credit. They treat you more like family. One of the best things about Capital Farm Credit is they speak our language. Together we're much better. All right, Mike, so we've learned all about cattle. Well, not really all about cattle, but some about cattle. But now we've transitioned to the other part of your operation, which is farming. So right. tell us, obviously, what you farm. We know cotton, which is in front of us, but what else do you farm? Uh, of course, you can tell right now we're in the middle of cotton harvest, which that's what we all look forward to every year after we've had a long season of growing. But uh, we've, uh, we also produce sugar cane and Milo, which is a grain sorghum, primarily used for feed, and we grow white corn and yellow corn. I've had your yellow corn before. It's pretty good. It, oh, that's a sweet corn. So. Yes, very, yes. very yep. sweet. Some of the other things that we do grow are onions. Uh, we uh, have a hay production part also that is either for sale or for our own cattle. And um, there's not too many things that we haven't grown. This year we grew some sesame. Um, we've tried soybeans and just about every kind of vegetable you can think of. But the main things we've settled on now are cotton corn, grain, sugar cane, and, and uh, onions. All right, Mike, so other than <laughs> to hit you with, no, I'm just kidding. What, um, for those watching that aren't familiar with cotton, explain to them you know, obviously we pulled this out of the ground, but how does cotton really start into this beautiful crop? What, well, how's the process? After the cotton's planted, it'll get to a certain stage and then it starts to what we call square. And what those are, the beginning of the fruit. And then long before this becomes this, it started out as a flower, real pretty flower. Usually whiter pink, correct? Whiter pink, that's correct, depending on the stage of it. And then once the flower is, is done, then it starts into a fruit called the cotton bowl. And loses the flower off the tip, the bowl starts to get bigger and bigger until it becomes mature. Once it becomes mature, then it'll actually open on its own. And that's what we're seeing today. You can't see this, but inside the cotton fiber is a seed. And I'm pulling that out of here right now. 
and there's a bunch of seeds in this cotton bowl right here. And what that seed does is not only the fiber that we sell, but that little seed right there is very, very important to us as, as cotton growers. Reason being is they crush it for cottonseed oil, which is used for cooking. They Did you know it. that there's uh, cotton in your Oreos? Cotton in our Oreos? Yeah. And I in your toothpaste, every time you brush your teeth. I did not know that. There's actually, that, they, that's a good one. they use the oil. The, uh, the other byproducts of it though are cottonseed meal, which is used primarily for cattle feed. And then another uh, uh, is cotton holes. It'll take the place of hay or something like that in a, in a regular ration. So uh, this is a very vital po uh, part of, of, of the cotton plant as well. The fiber itself, um, in fact, the varieties that we're growing today are just so far advanced compared to what they were 20, 30 years ago. So after, you know, your cotton has what we call defoliated, am I correct? That's correct. That's where we drop the leaves off of it, although this has, this has been a tough year to get the leaves off of it. So that's why you're seeing a little bit of green still in the field. So to get this out of the field though, we tell, I know what it is, but some people who are watching this may not know, what is it that we use to get out of the field? That's a cotton picker. That's not the latest in technology. The latest in technology is actually a cotton picker that makes a round bale. And then we pick up the round bales off the field, but we're still using the basket pickers mainly because a lot of our customers that I custom pick for, uh, I can simply do it cheaper. And, and even though I have more labor and whatnot, I don't have the investment that they have. Sooner or later, I'm gonna be into the baler machine myself, but uh, we, uh, the next process would be to pick the cotton. We'll put it into the cotton modules. From there, it goes to the gin, and then the gin will separate take out all the little trash, any little trash you see in there, they'll separate that and the seed. The seed goes one way, the cotton goes another, and then it's put into a 500 pound bale. We're just now getting started in the rows. We've got our units on and our machine in high gear and all we really do is follow the rows down and follow the rows back. Cotton doesn't like to be combined, it likes to be straight, so you always want to make sure your machine's being run straight. We can usually harvest a, a 40 acre tract in, in just about two, two and a half hours, three hours at the max. We start planting, I like to start planting cotton around the first week in March, typically March 1 if the weather's permitting. And I like to end up within the first two weeks of uh, March. And so you got all of March, all the way through, uh, I like, normally I like to have my cotton picked by August 15th. That's kind of an old, old rule because Anything after the August 15th, you're well into hurricane season and or potential or, 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 or rainier months, which September is our biggest rainy, I mean our largest rainy month. We're running about, these things will run about four and a half miles an hour, which if you can imagine, in my lifetime alone, I'm 59 years old, but in my lifetime, it went from hand harvest to a machine now that makes a round bale. It blows me away the technology as much as it's advanced just, at, just in 59 years. It doesn't seem very long when you put it into perspective. So how long do you think back in the, whenever it was being hand picked or hand harvested, how long did that process take? Did you just one field? Uh, depend on how many labor people you could get to to work but mind you they would never wait till it's all open like we do today they'd start getting the bowls open and they'd start harvesting at that time and then they just keep on harvesting until there wasn't any lint left so it was a fairly long process how do we know if you've had a good cotton crop how do we 
how do you count it? You know, same with corn or how do you know that you have a healthy crop that's going to make money? Regardless of what the price is, a farmer always wants to make a crop. And you feel bad if you don't. You feel bad if Mother Nature's treated you bad and you've had too much rain or too much drought, you can't get around to watering it or if you're a dry land farmer. But the main goal is to make a crop. When you do that, you'll worry about the price and the, and the different things, expenses later. But right here, you go to bed sleeping, knowing you, you, you've accomplished something. Then comes in the price. And most of the time, farmers or agriculture period doesn't dictate the price. Supply and demand and politics plays the rest. The government uses our commodities a lot of times as we've just are experiencing right now where sanctions have been put against some other countries and they're using our farm products to do that with. We've all experienced hunger before, you know, it's in between meals and you've had a tough day, whatever, but when you start getting hungry, your mind starts to wandering and a lot of times you're, you're, you're thinking bad things. You're not thinking rational. Every time I take a bite of something, I, I thank God that I've got that bite in my mouth. Knowing full well that I help feed the rest of the world, not just the nation, the nation's just part of the world. Hard work, dedicated hands, and a labor of love is what's brought this family so much success and love. And so I want to thank you, Cricket, and you, Mike, for allowing me to come and see your operation and see what hard work and faith in God can do for someone. And I'm excited to see what's to come for the years to come, and thanks for feeding America. Michelle, thank you for promoting agriculture like you do. See y'all next time. Bye, everyone. This week's episode is sponsored by 